Thank you, Steve. We, as Dave said, we had a great um, annual meeting last night, and uh, we elected uh, a number of people into office and also some new members, accepted, accepted them into membership. And so in two weeks hence, I think on the 26th it is, we will be recognizing all of them. And, and uh, so if you are uh, one of the new members or an officer, plan to be recognized on that day and plan to be here as well. We are with Jacob. Jacob, in this story, in chapter 32, is a chosen person. A chosen person of the promise. He is saved, if you will. And he is running for his life, as he has been, and now he's running back into danger. He has been gone for 20 years because of something that he did. And he has had 20 years of struggle. He's been in exile, and he has built a fortune and a family of his own. When he got to Haran, where his relatives were, his mother's relatives, he fell in love with a young girl named Rachel. Rachel had an older sister. Rachel was beautiful, her older sister less so. And Jacob worked for seven years so that he could marry Rachel. And in an almost Shakespearean comedy story, Jacob marries this woman who is covered in veils and then goes into the darkness of their wedding night tent and in the morning light realizes that he has married the older sister. He has been deceived in the dark by his own sensual senses, just like he had done to his own father, Isaac, who was blind and wanted the food he had for him. And so he began this 20-year journey. He worked another seven years, was married to these two sisters, Leah and Rachel. And Rachel, his favorite, was barren, as was his mother, Rebecca, and his grandmother, Sarah. Remember the patriarchal cycles. We're seeing these stories play out again and again. And these two uh, sisters are competing with one another. Rachel, who cannot bear children, gives, after Leah bears sons to him, Rachel gives uh, her handmaiden to uh, her husband to have sons with. And it's just like Sarah and Hagar again. And all the same kinds of trouble come about because of all these uh, competitive, dysfunctional relationships. But in the end, Jacob has 12 sons and one daughter. And these 12 sons are 12 princes of the tw 12 uh, tribes of Israel that is yet to be. But he could not yet see it, of course. None of us really can see much of anything of what's going to happen. Life is low to the ground, and we can't see very far out in front of us. But uh, we trust that God is at work, but we cannot yet see what God is doing. I'd like to share one more time out of The Son of Laughter, uh, this great novel that this Presbyterian uh, pastor and author, uh, Frederick uh, Beekner wrote 30 years ago, and it really is in the same vein as the Chosen series. It's, it's uh, uh, explaining the story, uh, um, a plausible background to the story. This is the voice of Jacob speaking. It's his inner voice describing his life here and describing this time um, in uh, Haran. He calls God the fear. 
And so that when in the book, when he says the fear, he means uh, Yahweh, the God of Israel. He says, in all, I had ten sons and one daughter by Leah and the two maids. In other words, everybody except Rachel, who had not yet had a child. Even with the building of seven, several new rooms, Laban's house was as crowded as a sheepfold. The children were everywhere. They were into everything. One by one, they learned to crawl and walk. They learned to talk after a fashion, as well as to scream and to make your ears ring with shrill laughter. They learned to poke and pinch and slap. Before they learned to take care of their needs outside, the house stank worse than the narrow sun-baked streets of Haran with their little mounds and puddles. They shattered the nights with their wails. I had begotten them all, but there had been no tenderness, no joy in their begatting. Zilpah and Bilhah, the two maidservants by whom he had children, they were strangers to me. Leah, once she established victory over her sister, became a kind of overpowering friend, though she was so caught up with her children that we had little time for friendship. And when there was time, I had to be careful that Rachel did not see us together. Rachel's beauty returned with the birth of Dan and Naphtali to her maidservant, but she gave as much of herself to them as though they had been truly hers, and we were seldom alone together. I was like a man caught out in a storm with the wind squalling, the sand flailing me across the eyes. The chilled rain pelting me. The children were the storm, I thought. Until one day, until one day, right in the thick of it, I saw the truth of what the children were. One boy was pounding another boy's head against the hard packed floor. Another was drowsing in his mother's teat. Three of them were trying to shove a fourth into a basket. Dina was fitting her foot into her mouth. The air was foul with the smell of them. They were, they were the fear's promise. That is what I suddenly saw the children were. I had forgotten it. They were the dust that would cover the earth. The great people would spring from their scrawny loins, kicking and howling and crowing and pissing and slobbering food all over their faces. They were the world's best luck. I started to weep. Just a trickle at first, the tears hot on my cheeks, salty at the corners of my mouth. Then it was as if I couldn't catch my breath for weeping. Laban, father-in-law, came over and pounded me between the shoulders. He thought I was choking to death. Rachel took my head in her arms. Leah held my feet. It was as close as the two sisters had come to each other for years. A deep hush fell over the children. They stopped whatever they were doing. Their eyes grew round in their heads. You are so, so noisy, I choked out at them. They were the fears promised to Abraham, and I had forgotten it. It was with Abraham's ancient eyes that they were watching me. You are so hopeless, I said, so important. Their silence as they listened to my sobs was Abraham's silence as he waited all those years for the fear to keep his promise.
what God is doing very, very often is right in front of us, and we just don't see it. And so in this passage that, that Steve has read for us, Genesis 32 here, starting at verse 10, Jacob is coming back into the promised land. God has told him to go home after 20 years with these two camps he has, these two wives, these, these two handmaidens, all these children, all these flocks that he has uh, acquired by his wits. And Jacob finally prays to God. He prays to God because he's afraid of his brother out in front of him. His brother, he has heard, is coming. Esau, after 20 years, I'm sure Esau has grown to monstrous proportions in his size. And he hears that Esau is coming with 400 men on horses. He's terrified. He has nothing to fight back with that. And so he prays to God and he said, you told me to return to your land and your relatives and I will, good, I will do good with you. And he says, I am unworthy of all the proofs of mercy and of all the dependability that you've shown me. Deliver me, please, because I am afraid of Esau. You yourself said, verse 13, I will most certainly do good with you and will make your seed like the sand of the sea that cannot be counted because of its abundance. Finally, Jacob says, I see what God has done. This is a different man than was running for his life 20 years ago. I may never understand what God is doing, but I see what he has done. And now I am afraid. And so he's acknowledging the condition of his soul when he was coming to Haran, when he was running from his brother, when he had stolen the blessing. I had nothing but my staff. And Lord, you have filled up my life. And it's only you that could have done that. But he's still in a survival situation. His own actions are still bringing waves of consequences back to him. And now, as a man of the promise, he has to learn how to deal with those consequences rightly and more properly. But he's still afraid. And so he does something that he's going to pay even more consequences for. He orders all his children and their mothers in order of who's most important to him. So he puts the handmaidens and their children up front in the most danger. And he puts Leah and her children behind them, and at the very back he puts his favorite, Rachel, who's now got little Joseph and uh, is carrying Benjamin. They're going to remember that, especially those sons up front. But Jacob himself is going to go out in front of them. But Jacob's heart has finally shifted. He finally prays to God with no conditions. When he came and God showed him this stairway into heaven and all this greatness and reminded him of this fantastic blessing and promise, Jacob responded by saying, that's great. So if you give me everything I need and bring me back safely, then you can be my God. If then. That's a conditional clause, if then. And God didn't offer a condition. He just said, I'm going to do this. That's such a parental thing. We offer our children unconditional love and then have to sort of just roll our eyes when they come back at us. Well, well but I need this and I need this. And then I'll be your, I'll be your child. <laughs> but the reason that Jacob does this, that's what gets my attention here. 
He does it because he pleads with God for salvation from his brother. Save me from my brother. And why, why should God do this? You should do this, Lord, because of your promise. He now is praying on the basis of the promise. Verse 13, you yourself said, Lord, I will most certainly do good with you and will make your seed like the seed, the sand of the sea that cannot be counted because of its abundance. He now sees the value of the gift in its, in its depth. He wanted it before so much that he stole it, but now he really knows, understands much, much better, 20 years better, what he's got his arms around. He knows what the promise looks like. And so it goes on, as Steve read for us, that he crossed uh, the Jabbok at night. He sent his wives, wives and kids across into the promised land. And it says in verse 25 that Jacob remained all by himself. All alone with his worst fears... All alone. No one to text to. Nothing to text with. No homies, no besties. All alone. And he had sent all, everything he valued into the promised land. He's committed. And it says, then a man wrestled with him until the break of dawn. Jacob is experiencing God making him Fight for it. You fled this place. I brought you back. How bad do you want it? Do you mean it? You were willing to deceive for it, but are you willing to fight me for it? Wrestle your way back in. Who is this? I am not alone. And it's just like the three men that appeared to Abraham a few chapters back. Abraham was so tuned in that he immediately knew that these were no mere men. He was talking to the Lord and two angels who were in the bodies of men. And so now Jacob uh, experiences this, we, we experience as readers this Bible ambiguity again. He wrestled with a man. And we're going to see by the end of the paragraph that the ambiguity is resolved when Jacob is told that he has wrestled with God himself. And so when uh, God, as a man, saw that he had not overcome Jacob just because he won't quit, he dislocated his hip. But... Jacob won't let go of him. I won't let you go unless you bless me. So he says to Jacob, what is your name? And Jacob gives him his name. That means something in that world. Jacob, he said. Jacob is admitting defeat. He won't quit, but he's admitting that he has been overwhelmed. He's been wanting the blessing all along. He's been willing to extort it for a bowl of stew from his brother and been willing to deceive uh, his way into it with a bowl of stew or, or meat for his dad. But now God himself requires all that Jacob is. I want your name, I want your identity and your vocation. And those are what are finally taken in exchange for the blessing. It's exactly what we have to do when we come to Jesus. The descendant of Jacob demands all from us. Your identity is now lost in my uh, death, burial, and resurrection. And so it's a, it's a same thing. And we'll, we'll look at that some more. In verse 29, uh, this man says, Your name will no longer be Jacob, but rather be Yisrael. Israel. 
One who wrestles with God, or even a prince with God, it could mean. You've struggled with God and with men and have overcome. And then Jacob, being Jacob and never quitting, please tell me your name. And he doesn't. <laughs> What's this? You're asking my name? You never quit, do you? Okay, then he blessed him. And that's why he blessed him, because he doesn't quit. Because he wants it, and because he gives over who he is. He gave his name to this one. God is showing me who I am. It's not what I imagined. What is your name? We have to ask that question. We ask that question our whole lives. And God is in the process of showing us who we are. We have learned that we are someone in Christ, but we're learning in Christ who we actually are. The person that we lie to most in this life is ourself. We have to maintain our own face in our own psyche. We have to maintain who we are. And so we imagine ourselves other than what we actually are. And it is God who makes us struggle and makes us wrestle with him who finally shows us who we are. So Jacob named the place Peniel, face of God. I've seen God face to face and I'm still alive to tell about it. Ha! That's something. And so God tests Jacob. He's coming back. How bad do you want it, Jacob? Will you fight for it? Will you give up your name for the promise? Your brother is not the one you should be afraid of. We're like that, aren't we? Our, our kids come home from school. They're just terrorized by somebody at school. And we're the ones who gave them life. We're the ones that provide everything they need. And they find no fear of us. That's good and that's bad. Don't worry about the little ones at school. Worry about the one uh, who is over you. Your brother's not the one you should fear. You are now Jacob. You are now Israel. Father of all the nation that does not yet exist. But will, and our Jesus comes from that nation, from Jacob, from Israel. And Jesus taught us the same principle about struggle. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18, at the beginning of the chapter, it says Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said in a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And the and the Lord Jesus said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? If the world that does not love you will yield to your persistence, imagine how God who does love you will hear your prayer. And so we struggle. We're told to struggle. The question is, do you believe in what you're praying for? Do you need what you're praying for? Give us this day our daily bread. My daily bread? I got a whole freezer full of stuff. I'm good for days and days. But what I need, what I need is what I need today. That's my need. What are we praying for? We say in the arrogance of our time and in our culture, I want it all. 
That's a distraction. That's about my greatness and my destiny. And I'll never be able to appreciate what I have unless I get it all. I'm finding that I'm becoming more and more appreciative of all the things that are around me as the days go by. I'll, it's suddenly, I never paid attention to it for all my life, but all of a sudden, I'm really amazed about sliced bread. That's cool. I get happy about that. Hot water. Whoa! Amen. <laughs> uh, there are all manner of things that we don't pay much attention to for most of our lives because we're just too important. And then suddenly you realize uh, all the things we need to be grateful for. And th to say that I want it all is really just a distraction from what the Lord has for me. Well, Jacob is still Jacob. We are still ourselves. We're still learning and becoming. Uh, even, even sometimes having to sadly live with the consequences of past you know, foolishness. As completely forgiven, completely chosen, saved people. But we're in the same network of relationships, same weaknesses. So Paul puts these two things out there, how, how this is in our life how this struggle is. He says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he says that if anyone is in Messiah, the new creation has come. The old has gone and the new is here. We're a new person. We're a new man, a new woman. We're made new in Christ. We are truly different. We have a new name. He says, you are mine. You have my name. And it's not, though, it's not a magic trick. We talk about it like it's, you know, they talk about, you know, a hack for this and a hack for that. This is not a God hack. This isn't some psychological trick so that I can be happy. What we're really being happy about is uh, our perfect American life when we, when we talk like that and think like that. No, when we are made new in Christ, when we are made truly different with a new identity, it means we're beginning to get, we are now ready for the conflict of being Jesus' people in this world. Because the chapter before, Paul describes how his life actually work at, works as a new creation. He's a new man in Christ, and he says it this way in chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians. He says, we are hard-pressed on every side but not crushed because of Christ. We are perplexed, but not in despair because of Christ. We are persecuted, but not abandoned because of Christ. We are struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. We are experiencing the life that God gives in the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. We are experiencing that life by dying in Christ, by dying to ourself, by giving over our name to God and letting him uh, give us the name by which we live. Jesus, the Christ, the King is the living promise of God. The promise that started with Abraham, came down through Isaac and through Jacob, found its ultimate reality in Jesus. He is the living promise of God, and he is the only basis for moving this, this crazy life that, that we've had, that I've had, for moving it into kingdom of heaven values. Why else would I do that? Why would I love my enemies unless I had been loved as an enemy by someone who considered me an enemy? I am declared gods. You are declared gods in Christ. You're forgiven, given the Holy Spirit. And then that reality... In that reality, that new man, that new woman, God begins to move through that bent and broken us 
and begins to recraft and remake and heal piece by piece, bit by bit. And so we are a new man or a new woman in Christ, and that is an eternal reality that cannot change. That is a fact. And yet, I'm saved, but I'm being saved. Because when I pass out of this deteriorating body and take on a new body that will never deteriorate, I will really know what it means to be saved in a whole new way that I don't really get now. God has saved me, and he's saving me. Same for all of us. Well, what do you do with that? We wrestle with God. We wrestle with life. We walk with a limp. <laughs> All the consequences. If you're young, if you're in high school, if you're just out of high school, think for a minute, do a little uh, math here. How old will you be in 20 years? Hmm... 36, 37, 38, 40. Oh, but that's 20 years. I got news for you. You're going to wake up one day and go, how did I get here? <laughs> it goes really fast, especially when you have a whole bunch of uh, little ones to occupy your energy and time. And you will have to have experienced... God driving the foolishness out of your heart. God says that in his word that foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. We're all that way. And so that wisdom that we acquire in life, uh, we're helped with that by our parents, hopefully, and hopefully by our school. You know, when we're little, we think we can defy gravity. I'll be the one who jumps off the kitchen counter and I'll be able to fly. Hasn't worked yet. And we have various versions of that that involve not wearing seat belts and driving too fast and drinking beers while we're doing that. And I tell you the truth, just a note of wisdom for the next 20 years. Whatever you force in this life I'm smart enough, I'm big enough, I'm stronger, I'm whatever to put this over on this other person so I can get what I want. Like Jacob took his brother's blessing. Whatever you force, you will pay for. You'll end up walking with a limp. And so let God uh, walk you through life with what you have and what, let him give you what you need. It begins with Christ. You begin to see and to understand and have the ability, through the Spirit of God, you have the ability to love your enemies, to not see them as enemies anymore, and a whole bunch of other things that go along with that. Or you could ask it in a negative way. What am I making God do to me to get me into the promised land? Don't put him in that position. Learn parenting from God. He parents the same way we do if we're wise. I had an old cowboy tell me that parenting was a lot like working with a new colt, trying to let that uh, colt uh, become a horse, to break it, so that you can ride it and it can, it can uh, do what it was made to do. He said... You be as gentle as you can and firm as you must. And so it is with God. He encourages us with his unconditional love. I gave you everything. Every spiritual blessing in the whole universe is yours, he says to us. And he knows that with our childish, foolish hearts, we're going to come back with conditions. Yes, but I want this and I want that and I want that. 
then I'll be happy and fulfilled. Learn to live in the promise, like Jacob was having to learn. Live with your whole life. Learn to trust in Jesus instead of trusting in yourself. That's really hard to do, but it's where we start from. Do everything you can. Struggle like this, this widow with the unjust judge. Keep pressing the bell. Do what you have to do. Be as strong as you can in life. And when you get to the place where you cannot get there, you can't reach any further, then you'll see where God does his work. You'll know it was the Lord who took you to that place. Uh, and so... Jesus bids us uh, to, to, uh, to trust him uh, in, the, in the fog of everyday life that we can't quite see where God is taking all this. Trust him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your uh, ancestor, Jacob, that you knew, <laughs> that you wrestled with. Thank you that we learn from his life and that we see what a very strong, determined man must submit to you. He must give his name. He must give his identity and his, his vocation, his whole being over to you in order to get the blessing in order to really live in the promise. We are recipients of that glorious promise. Help us, Lord, to live in that promise, to trust that this promise is bigger and better than what I think I want for myself. Help us to see that, Lord, as the days go by. Help us to trust you and live in you. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand as we sing our final song together, Redeemed. Redeemed.